This is Unit 12 on Confirmatory Factor Analysis, and this unit will build on our previous unit, which was on Exploratory Factor Analysis. And then to do Confirmatory Factor Analysis, we're going to use Structural Equation Modeling, or SEM. And we talked about Structural Equation Modeling in a previous unit, where we used Structural Equation Modeling to estimate regression equations. And so what I want to do now is first review structural equation modeling and how we can use structural equation modeling to estimate regression equations and then go on to use structural equation modeling to estimate confirmatory factor analysis models. So first let's review how we can estimate regression equations using structural equation modeling or SEM. And here is the picture of a regression model that we looked at in our previous unit where we have three predictive variables, x1, x2, and x3, and a single outcome variable, y. And so this is a multiple regression equation with three predictors and one outcome. And when we draw a picture, we put our x variables in boxes, we put our y variable in a box, and we use straight lines with arrows to indicate a regression relationship. So x1 predicts y, and we indicate that with a straight line with an arrow from x1 pointing to y. And x2 predicts y, so we have a straight line with an arrow there. And x3 predicts y, so we have three predictors, so we have three straight lines with arrows. And then in, when we draw our picture, we also have these curved lines with double arrows, an arrow on each end. And those represent correlations. So we say that x1 can correlate with x2, x2 correlates with x3, and x1 can correlate with x3. And one of the key things we talked about before was that in this model, we have six different parameters that we are estimating. We are estimating three beta weights, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Uh, that is the beta weight for each x variable when it's predicting y in this regression equation. And our model also includes three correlations. We have x1 can correlate with x2, x2 with x3, and x1 with x3. So we have three different correlations. So we have three beta weights and three correlations that we're estimating in this model. And then we also talked about how this model has four variance components. Each one of my x variables will have a variance, or a standard deviation, or standard deviation squared. So I have the variance of each of my predictors. And then my y variable, the outcome, will also have a variance. But when we're doing structural equation modeling, uh, if we have a, an outcome that's getting predicted by other variables, we don't care so much about its variance, but we're going to be focusing on its residual variance. That is the same thing as what we've been also calling the standard error of estimate. Uh, that is the residual variance that's left over after everything has been explained by our predictor variables. Or another way of saying that is, what's the average deviation for how far each person's uh, observed scores deviate from the predicted values um, would be the uh, residual variance or the standard error of estimate. So we have four variance components, the variance of our x variables, 1, 2, and 3, and the residual variance, which is the same thing as the standard error of estimate, for the outcome variable y. Now, one thing that I didn't do before that I would like to do now is that it's actually common to draw the variance components on the picture of the path model when you draw pictures of path models. And so when we draw variance components on our models, one of the most common ways to draw them is to just draw them with an arrow and they're unenclosed. There's no box, no circle. I'm drawing a circle around it now, but it shouldn't be enclosed in anything. So it's just a out in the open, not enclosed. Uh, so if I SD squared, that's the variance of x1, and just have an arrow pointing to x1, and that's a way of indicating that x1 has a variance. And then I do SD squared for x2 with an arrow pointed at, and that's a way of indicating that x2 has a variance. And then I have E, or the residual, of y with an arrow pointed at that, indicating that y will have a residual variance. So the common way to draw the variance components in the figure is simply to draw them unenclosed, not in a box, not in a circle, but just draw the component with an arrow pointing to the box or to the thing that it is the variance of. So if I have a variance of x1, I just have xd squared x1 with an arrow pointing to x1. So this model now is showing that all of our x variables each have a variance, and our outcome variable y has a residual variance.
Another thing that I didn't talk about before uh, was some terminology where it's common to distinguish between variables that are called endogenous and exogenous. And that has to do with whether they get predicted by anything. So an exogenous variable is essentially what we could call an independent variable. It's one that's not getting predicted by anything. So these three x variables, they aren't getting predicted by anything. Um, sometimes if you're using the term independent and dependent, you could call them an independent variable because they're not getting predicted by anything. In uh, doing structural equation modeling, we're going to use the term exogenous, which means it's not getting predicted by anything. And though, so now tying the term exogenous to what I was just talking about in terms of variances, we can say that an exogenous variable uh, will have a variance, but not a residual variance. And so I've highlighted, uh, these aren't supposed to be circles, they're just supposed to be that I've highlighted my three uh, variances for my x1, x2, and x3, and know that those are variances, not residual variances, because x1, x2, and x3 are exogenous variables are not predicted by anything. So the variables that are not predicted by anything, we call them exogenous variables, and each of those variables will have a variance, and it's not a residual variance because it's not predicted by anything. So that each of our exo each exogenous variable, uh, that's tricky to say, each exogenous variable will have a variance. And I've got the variances highlighted in this picture. In contrast, an endogenous variable is a variable that's getting predicted by something, or it's what we could call a dependent variable if we're using the independent dependent language. So in this model, the y variable is the outcome variable. It's the thing getting predicted by stuff. We can call that an endogenous variable. And whereas an exogenous variable will just have a regular variance, for the endogenous variables, when we do our models, we're going to focus on its error variance, its residual variance, or that standard error of estimate. And again, I've highlighted that. That's not supposed to be a circle. It's just that I've highlighted it to indicate that that variance, because y is an endogenous variable, because it's getting predicted by stuff, it will have an error variance or residual variance. And that's what we're going to focus on when we do our structural equation modeling. That's the parameter estimate or the thing we're going to focus on trying to estimate when we do our model. And as we're going through these structural equation models, it's helpful to also be familiar with how you would specify them or how you would describe them if you were using the uh, software package R uh, along with the package Levon to estimate your model. Um, so if you're using the R and using the uh, Levon package, which is a package in R that you can use to estimate structural equation models, uh, there are three key terms that you would need to be familiar with to specify this regression model that we're looking at right here. The first term is regressed on. And whenever we're doing regression, we can always describe our models by saying an outcome variable y is regressed on our x variables. That's how that term regressed on would be used. You would say y is regressed on your predictor variables. So this model, we have an outcome variable y that's regressed on three predictors, x1, x2, and x3. And in Levon, the uh, term re regressed on is indicated by this tilde symbol, that little squiggly tilde symbol. So if you say y tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3, that's a way of specifying y is regressed on x1, x2, and x3. In other words, it's saying we have a regression equation with one outcome variable y and three predictors, which are x1, x2, and x3. And another term to be familiar with, if you're using the Levon computer uh, software package, is correlated with. In this model, we have three correlations that we would need to specify. We need to say this model has three correlations in it. And we can describe those correlations if we're using the Levon language uh, by saying these variables are correlated. And the, the symbol to do that is two tildes next to each other, tilde, tilde. I guess that's kind of a funny thing to say, but if I have x1 tilde tilde x2, it means x1 is correlated with x2. And I've just written out that one correlation here, 
the correlation between x1 and x2. Of course, this model, we actually have three. So if I was going to write this full model, if I was going to describe this full model that we're looking at, or specify this full model, I'd have to specify three correlations. I'd have to specify that x1 is correlated with x2, x1 tilde tilde x2, and that x2 is correlated with x3, x2 tilde tilde x3, and that x1 is correlated with x3, x1 tilde tilde x3. So I'd have to specify three correlations. And then in addition, uh, we need to specify the variance components of our model. And so the term has a variance is all is another uh, term to be familiar with if you're using Levon. And the, the, the symbol for having a variance is actually the same as correlated with. So if I do x1 tilde tilde x2, that's saying that x1 and x2 are correlated with each other. If I do x1 tilde tilde x1, that is x1 tilde tilde itself, that's a variance. Recall that makes sense if you if you think back to what we've talked about before about a variance covariance matrix and the difference between a variance and a covariance. Recall that the formula for a covariance involves uh, a centered variable times a partner, such as x1 centered x1 times centered x2, and that the formula for a variance involves a centered variable times itself. So that the formulas for variance and covariance, if you recall, are similar formulas. It's just a matter of, are you looking at a variable times a partner, which would give you a covariance? And then if you divide that by a measure of average variance, the product of your two center deviations, you would get a correlation. So a correlation is involves a variable times a partner. And a variance, our formula there, involves uh, a variable times itself. And so it makes sense that if you do x1 tilde tilde a partner, such as x2, x1 tilde tilde x2, that's x1 is correlated with x2. If you do x1 tilde tilde itself, x1 tilde tilde x1, that you're saying x1 has a variance. So that's a way that we could specify that x1 has a variance. So we can specify uh, which variables are we, uh, that y is regressed on which x variables, that is what are our predictors. We can specify our correlations and we can specify our variances using this, these symbols and this language and this terminology if we're using the Levon computer program. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the fun stuff. We are ready to talk about confirmatory factor analysis. And this slide here with this uh, funny looking bird looking at us is uh, gives a uh, diagram for a confirmatory factor analysis model with just one factor. Now, when you first look at this, you might think this model looks an awful lot like the regression models that we were just looking at. But there are several very important differences between this model that we're looking at now and the previous regression model that we were just looking at. One of the key things is that note there is no y variable. There's no outcome variable in this model. Instead, what I have over here, I now have this factor score. And this is kind of like in our previous unit when we talked about extracting factors out of items and we extracted one factor out and we called that factor score A. Well, that's what this is right here. This F is the factor score that can get extracted out of items. And so in this model, I've got three items or three indicators. Say these might be three questions on a questionnaire, all measuring a symbol, a single construct. Uh, maybe it is how much do you feel nervous when you look at this crazy looking bird? Uh, and so maybe I have three items on my questionnaire and it's, these items are all indicator, uh, indicators of a single factor, which maybe I call that factor score A. And I'll indicate it with an F and an oval. So let's go through and look at the key differences between this model, this confirmatory factor analysis model that we're looking at here, and how this is different from the regression models that we were just looking at a moment ago. So first, one very important difference, note the direction of the arrows. When we were looking at regression, we had arrows going from x to a y variable, an outcome. Now we've got arrows going the other direction from right to left. We have a factor score f, and we've got arrows going from the factor to the item. The arrows are pointing to my x variables. They're not pointing away from my x variables. 
Recall that makes sense when we're talking about factor analysis. Recall how we extract a factor out of the items, and then we do these regression models where we use that factor to predict variance in each item. And we use the factor score to explain variance in X1. We use that factor to explain variance in X2. We use that factor to predict variance in X3. So we have three regression equations. We use our factor score to predict each item. And that's what we were doing in our previous unit on exploratory factor analysis. And that's what's being depicted here. We're not using our X variables to predict our factor, but rather we're using our factor score to explain variance or to predict each X variable. So the arrow goes from the factor to the item. This makes sense in terms of, for example, if I was trying to measure depression and I had three items on a questionnaire measuring, uh, like how much do you agree with the statement, I feel sad and blue, or I feel life is hopeless, and people might rate the extent to which they agree with those statements on a scale of one to five. And I would assume that your response, if you, if you select that I'm feeling really sad and blue, that that response is an indication of the fact that you're feeling depressed. I would say that I don't think that because you chose that option that's making you depressed, that your response to that questionnaire item isn't causing you to be depressed. So the arrow doesn't go this direction. It's not that my response on this item is causing you to be depressed, but rather your response to an item is an indicator of your depression. So we have the arrows going from the factor to the item with the idea that the items are indicators of the factor. And so that makes sense both theoretically in terms of we think of the items are indicators of factors. They're not causes of our factors. They're indicators of it. And it also fits what we were talking about in our previous unit where we had regression equations where we used a factor score to predict each individual X variable. And that's what the model is that we're looking at here. And to clarify uh, the type of model that we have and to clarify that this is different from the regression model, we're no longer going to call these weights beta weights. Uh, we're going to give them a different name just to clarify that this is a little bit different type of thing where we're using a factor score to explain variance in an observed variable. So note that the factor score, we might call that a latent variable. It's unobserved. We don't actually have, um, we didn't actually collect data specifically regarding a factor score. It's something that's extracted out of our variables, uh, but we didn't observe it directly. So we can call it a latent variable or a construct. Um, and if we're using a latent variable, to explain variance in actually observed items, uh, we're not going to call these beta weights. Uh, these still actually are regression weights, but we're going to give them a different letter. We're going to give them the Greek uh, label lambda. So we're going to call these lambda loadings and use that Greek letter lambda to in indicate our loadings just to clarify that this is a little bit different type of a model from the types of regression models we were just looking at, that we're looking at how much a factor score uh, is predicting an item here. So. One of the key things here, we have our directions going from right to left, from the factor score to the item, the, the arrows are pointing towards our item, and these are still regression uh, equations. We're still saying that uh, in a regression equation, we have our factor score predicting x1, and another regression equation where the factor score is predicting x2. So I still have straight uh, lines here. Just, we can just talk about that it's still a regression relationship. Um, but it's a little bit different type of thing because it's a regression relationship where our predictor is a factor score. And so we're going to use that Greek letter lambda to indicate our regression loadings, what would normally be our beta weights. We're now going to call them lambda loadings just to clarify that we have a slightly different type of model here. And as I noted, our factor score is a latent variable. There's a few different terms we could use to describe that. We could call it a latent variable. We could call it an, an unobserved variable or a construct. Uh, these are all different ways of, of saying the same thing. And by latent variable, what I mean is we did not directly observe this, but rather it's something that was extracted out of the items we did observe. Uh, so it, we didn't actually collect data directly on this latent variable, but it's this hypothetical construct that was extracted out of our items. And we talked before in our unit on exploratory factor analysis, how we could extract factors out of items. And we have people's scores on factor scores, but we didn't originally collect data on those factor scores, but these are scores that are extracted out of the data we collected. And so we'll call these things that are unobserved because we did not directly observe them. We extracted them out of the items we have. And the common term for that is to call it a latent variable.
And when depicting diagrams for structural equation modeling, the common format is to put observed variables in boxes or rectangles and to put latent variables in ovals or circles. So I have my latent variable note that I, that's not a box and that's important. That's an oval or a circle could work just as fine. And my observed variables are in boxes. So the factor score is a latent variable. It's indicated by an oval, not a box. And also note that our factor score does not have any predictors. So that essentially makes it an exogenous variable. And this variance right here then is going to be a total variance. It's not going to be a residual variance because there's nothing predicting it. Now I might note, if you wanted to get into more advanced fancy models, we can actually have models where things predict factor scores. That's uh, something we can do. We're not going to get to that in this class, but just as a note, that is possible to do if you want to get, get into really advanced complex models. Uh, but that would, that would actually be going up beyond a confirmatory factor analysis. So if you're doing confirmatory factor analysis, your factor score will not have any predictors. If you were doing other types of structural equation modeling, your factor score could have a predictor. So we're going to focus on confirmatory factor analysis and our factor scores will be uh, exogenous variables. They will have no predictors, which means that their variance will be just their total variance. It will not be a residual variance. It will be the total variance. So it has no predictors and it will have a variance, uh, but not a residual variance E. And then in this model, my X variables are the indicators of the factor. The factor was extracted out of my X variables and now I'm using my factor to predict each X variable in a series of regression equations and that's what's depicted here. And so my X variables are indicated. So if I had a questionnaire, say measuring depression, maybe X1 was an item of I feel sad and blue that you rate on a scale of one to five. Uh, maybe X2 was I feel hopeless about the future. And maybe X3 could be maybe sometimes I feel suicidal or, or something like that. And people rate the extent to which they agree with each of these items. And uh, they're summed together to get a total score for depression. And so I have three items, X1, X2, X3, are all supposed to be indicators of a common factor. In this example, maybe it's uh, how much someone feels depressed. So note that now my X variables, uh, they are all getting predicted by my factor score. So they have arrows pointing to them, not arrows pointing away, but arrows pointing to them. So that means these are now endogenous variables and these Air variances are now, these are not total variances, these are now air variances. So when we were looking at regular regression models, we had X variables that were predictors of an outcome, and each X variable was exogenous. Each X variable uh, had a total variance, but not a, not a residual variance because it wasn't predicted by anything. Now I've got arrows pointing towards my X variables, so that now they're endogenous variables, and now each of these variances is an air variance or a residual variance. So X variables are the indicators. Each X is going to be predicted by Y in a regression equation. And each X variable will now have an air variance or a residual variance uh, for that X variable. So I've got my three, so we actually have one arrow pointing this way, which is my lambda loading, how much the factor explains variance in my X variable. And then I have this residual air variance, which is the stuff that's not explained by the factor with an arrow pointing to it that way. So uh, I've got each item is explained by part by the factor score with the lambda loading and it's part air variance is what this is showing. Note how this is consistent with reliability theory. When we talked about reliability, we talked about how uh, items can be composed of two components. They can be part true variance and part measurement error variance. And that's, that's essentially what we're modeling here. If I take this lambda loading and square it, I'll have the percent of variance explained because this is essentially a regression equation using my factor score to predict X1. And uh, we're going to be assuming throughout uh, this unit, I, should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, we'll, we'll assume that we're going to turn everything to z-scores prior to analysis. That's one of the common assumptions we make when we do structural equation modeling. 
I think I mentioned that in the previous unit. We're going to continue to make that assumption here. We're going to assume that I've turned everything into z-scores prior to analysis. And so if I have uh, everything as z-scores and I use my factor score to predict x in a regression equation, then if everything is z-scores, then this lambda is the standardized beta weight. And it's a standardized beta weight in a simple regression equation with just one predictor. I have just one predictor factor score predicting x1. And uh, so this lambda weight, this re the standardized regression equation, is the same thing as the correlation between my factor score and x1. Recall that's the same thing we saw in our previous unit on exploratory factor analysis, where we had uh, a component ma uh, our, our component matrix, we had a structure matrix, and a pattern matrix. Uh, and we saw that if we use a regression equation where we use our factor score to predict each x variable, our standardized beta weights were the same things as the correlations we get if we calculate the correlation between our factor score and each item. And so that's what we have here. So our lambda, if we square that, that would actually give us the same thing as a squared correlation, which is the percent of variance explained. So the key thing there to note is that if you take this lambda loading and square it, you will have the percent of variance in x that's explained by the factor score. And this error variance, note that actually the way that this works is our lambda loadings are typically not squared coefficients, but our variances, these are actually variances squared, standard deviations are variances, so these are already squared. So to get uh, things to add up here, we would need to square our lambda loading to get the percent of variance explained, but our variance is already a squared value. So that means if we take our squared lambda loading plus our error variance, that gives us the total variance of x1. In other words, we're partitioning the total variance of x1 into our uh, true variance, our explained variance, which is our lambda squared, plus our error variance, which is simply our variance, which is already squared. So true variance is lambda squared, and our measurement error variance is e. And if you add that together, you get the total variance of x. And if everything is turned to z-scores prior to analysis, then the variance of x will be 1. If everything is z-scores, x will have a standard deviation of 1, and 1 squared is 1, so it will have a standard, standard deviation and a variance of 1. So in other words, if, you, if everything is turned to z-scores prior to analysis, which we're going to be assuming that throughout this entire unit, that means that lambda squared plus our error variance will sum up to 1. That will be the total variance of x1. And that fits with reliability theory in looking at how we can take an item and partition it and say that part of this item is capturing true variance, the part that overlaps with our factor, and part of this item is capturing measurement error variance, the part that's unique and doesn't overlap with the factor. And then finally, our model has these correlations over here on the left-hand side of the figure. And this looks a little bit similar to our regression model that also had correlations between our x variables but these correlations here are something different because these are actually correlations between our residuals. That is, they're like partial correlations. So this is to what extent is this residual of x1, that part of x1 that couldn't be explained by the factor, to what extent does the residual of x1 correlate with the residual of, of x2? So this correlation r12, that's the correlation between the residual of x1 and the residual of x2. That is, after controlling for the factor, after controlling for the extent to which these items overlap with a factor, after the factor explains all the variance it can in x1, and after the factor explains all the variance it can in x2, is there any residual variance between x, uh, that any residual relationship between x1 and x2? Are these variables correlated in any way that's not already explained by the fact they're both indicators of the same factor? As we're going to see in a moment, when we're doing confirmatory factor analysis, we actually don't want our residuals to be correlated. We want a clean factor analysis model be one where our factor explains all the important variance in our, in our items. And uh, once we've explained all the important variance, all the leftover stuff is just measurement error that doesn't correlate with anything. And we don't have any correlations between our residuals. So that's actually something we're going to look at in just a moment, is that actually our residuals should not be correlated. But what we're looking at in this model right here, we've got a correlation between to what extent does a residual of x1 correlate with the residual of x2. 
we can think of that as uh, a partial correlation. What is the correlation between x1 and x2 with a factor extracted out? Uh, after you extract the factor out of x1, extract the factor out of x2, to what extent does the residual of x1 correlate with the residual of x2? That's what this correlation is looking at. So our correlations are now not correlations between the regular x variables, but correlations between the errors, or the residuals of x, when the factor is extracted out. That is, between the parts of x that are not explained by the factor. Now, if you were to do a confirmatory factor analysis using the computer package R with the package uh, Levon uh, to do an, a structural equation modeling within the R computer program, uh, if you're doing that, there's one more term you would need to be familiar with to specify or to, or to describe a confirmatory factor analysis model, and that is this term here, indicated by. Um, and that's if we have a model where we say we have an unobserved latent variable, this factor is indicated by these three predictors, um, then we'll use the symbol equal tilde. So an equal sign followed by a tilde symbol, those two things put together, equal tilde, uh, means indicated by. So I have here f equal tilde, f equal tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3 means that I have a factor score f which is indicated by x1, x2, and x3. Now, as you note, these are actually just three separate regression equations where I use my factor score to predict x1 in a regression equation. I use my factor score to predict x2 in a regression equation. I use my factor score to predict x3 in a regression So I actually have three regression equations here. But to clarify that we actually have a confirmatory factor analysis model where I have this latent unobserved variable factor score A, or whatever I want to call it, factor score F, um, I'm going to specify that by saying this factor score is indicated by these indicators. So f equal tilde means f is indicated by this factor score, whatever I want to name it, in this case I just named it f, is, is indicated by x1, x2, and x3. And that's the way of specifying what the indicators are for a factor. So to summarize, this is the diagram that depicts a confirmatory factor analysis model with one factor. I've got my one factor score here. It's indicated by three items. Maybe there are three items on a questionnaire or whatever type of assessment uh, I'm doing. Those are my three indicators of my factor. And I've got uh, correlations between the residuals of my items and putting it all together. Here we have our diagram for a confirmatory factor analysis model. Now this model right here actually has no constraints placed on it. At this point I'm showing you all the possible parameters that we could estimate and to do a confirmatory factor analysis, we're going to need to put constraints on our model. We, we can't do a model and just estimate all the possible parameters. It wouldn't be possible and it wouldn't be informative. So to actually make a confirmatory factor analysis model useful, we need to take this model here, which is showing you all the possible parameters we could estimate, and now we need to put some constraints on our model. And the first constraint that I'm going to place on my model is that I'm going to say that my error variances are not allowed to correlate. So note in this picture, I've taken away uh, these double-headed arrows that I had in the previous picture. I had correlations between my error variances, and I'm going to take them away. I'm going to fix them to be zero. I'm going to say they should not exist. That is, after I account for all the variance that can be explained by my factor score, x1 should not have any residual variance, any residual variance that can't be explained by the factor. It should not have any residual variance that correlates with the residual variance of x2. There should not be a partial correlation between these variables after explaining variance that can be explained by the factor. That is, any relationship between x1 and x2, the entire relationship between these two variables, should be fully explained by the factor, both indicators of the same factor. And after controlling for the fact that x1 and x2 are both indicators of the same factor, they shouldn't have any special shared relationship with each other. The remaining variant should all be error variants that doesn't correlate with anything. And so that my model says that the, the, the true variance, the variance we can explain in x1 and x2 is all accounted for by my factor, and the residual variance is just error variance that doesn't correlate with anything, 
And after accounting for the variance that can be explained by my factor, x1 and x2 don't have any special shared relationship above, uh, with each other above and beyond uh, their common shared uh, association with that factor. So my error variances should not correlate. And when you do a confirmatory factor analysis model, that's one of the common constraints that we almost always put on models. There could be a few exceptions, but for the most part, when I do confirmatory factor analysis, I'm going to put a constraint on my model that says, my error should not be correlate, it should not be correlated, so I'm going to fix all the correlations between my errors at zero. So in other words, I'm going to say this correlation right here between x1 and x2, that correlation between the residuals, that should be zero. Correlation between x2 and x3, that residual correlation should be zero. And this one right here should be zero. Those three correlations will all be fixed to be zero when I do my confirmatory factor analysis. Now, sometimes, uh, we want to do a confirmatory factor analysis for a model that has just one factor. But more often than not, we have more than one factor that we want uh, to test in our model. Uh, and so let's uh, take a look at a model that has two factors. So here is a diagram depicting a confirmatory factor analysis where I've got two factors, what I could call factor one and factor two, or we could call it factor A and factor B, whatever terms we want to give. So I've got two different factors here. And so I have x1 and x2 and x3. These three x variables are all indicators of my first factor. And x4 and x5 and x6 are all indicators of my second factor. So for example, maybe uh, factor 1 was a measure of depression. And factor 2, maybe it was supposed to be a measure of anxiety. So I have maybe three items measuring how much someone feels depressed here. And maybe x4 is uh, has to do with uh, uh, how much I feel anxious. And x5 is I'm feeling worried about the future. And uh, x6 is sometimes I experience uh, feelings of panic or something like that. So maybe I have three different items measuring experiences of anxiety. So now I've got one factor, say measuring depression with, with three indicators, three items, and a second factor, maybe measuring anxiety with three factors. Got two factors, and each factor has a set of indicators. Uh, now when I do this, uh, I'm going to have a correlation here between my two factors. Now, as we'll see later on here, we could set that correlation to be zero if I wanted to say my factors don't correlate, or I could allow my factors to correlate. And note that's analogous to what we've talked about in our previous unit on exploratory factor analysis between orthogonal and oblique rotation, where we decide, do we want to allow factors to correlate or not? So if I allow this correlation right here between my factors to be free, to be a correlation, to be whatever it needs to be, that's kind of like doing an, an oblique rotation where I allow my factors to correlate. So I could say that someone who's depressed might also feel anxious to some degree. That would be a, allow there to be a correlation between my two factors. Or, as we'll see it later on, we could also specify this correlation to be zero, which would be essentially forcing it to be an orthogonal correlation where uh, scores on factor one have nothing to do with scores on factor two, and we could test that as well if we if that was our theory and that was what we wanted to test. So we've got a model here with two factors, and our model now also includes this correlation between my two factors. And now that I've added that second factor, uh, we can talk about a second key constraint that I'm going to place on a confirmatory factor analysis model. This is something that actually would not be relevant. We would not need to worry about this if I only had one factor. But once I have two or more factors, then I need to do this second key constraint. And that is that each item, each x variable, should load on one and only one factor. So I have x1, x2, and x3 are all indicators of factor one. In other words, I can say these items all load on factor one using the language of factor analysis where we talk about items loading on their factors. So we can say x1, x2, and x3 are all indicators of factor 1, or another way of saying the same thing, they all load on factor 1. And x4, x5, and x6, these three indicators, uh, maybe these are my three anxiety items, and they all load on factor 2. They're all indicators of factor 2. So, uh, so I'm saying that each item loads on only one factor. Note that I don't have an arrow going here. So note that I could have drawn, if I draw all the possible arrows, we could uh, we could have all the items 
loading on both factors, but I'm not drawing all these arrows. Each item only loads on one factor, and uh, essentially what I'm doing is saying I'm fixing the other loadings to be zero. So each X loads on only one factor. I'm fixing the loadings on the other factor to zero. So in other words, this loading here of how much does F my factor two, how much does factor two predict X1? Or how much is X1 an indicator of factor two? Or how much is X1 load on factor two? How much does factor two predict X1 are always saying the same thing? And I'm fixing that loading to be zero. I'm saying that is zero. There's no effect there. And likewise, I'm saying this pathway is zero and this pathway is zero. And, oops, I think it was that one there, roundabout way. And uh, this pathway is zero. So I've got three loadings that I'm allowing, three lambda loadings, path loading, three, three lambda loadings that I'm allowing to be free. But there's also, or, or, I guess I have six altogether, three for factor one and three for factor two. So I've got six lambda loadings altogether uh, that I'm estimating that are free to vary, that I'm allowing to be whatever they need to be. But there's also six loadings that I'm fixing to be zero that I've eliminated from my model. And that's the second key constraint that I'm making when I do a confirmatory factor analysis. Once again, you, there, there could be some rare situations where you want to make an exception where maybe you think item three should be an indicator of maybe both factor one and factor two, um, and you could do that, uh, but uh, that kind of violates the idea of trying to get a clean solution in factor analysis, and it's a, a rare thing uh, to allow that, and usually uh, when people do that type of thing, it makes models sloppier than they are useful. Um, so it's possible to do, but not something I would recommend in general, and definitely not something I'll have you doing for this class. So in general, for this class, when you do confirmatory factor analysis, we will always follow the policy of each X loads on one and only one factor. So putting everything together, uh, what I've been talking about up to this point, if I had a two-factor model with six items, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6, if I had six indicators and two factors, and I were to try to, to draw a path or a confirmatory factor analysis model with no constraints, these are all the possible parameters that I could put on my model. So this is showing you all the possible parameters that we could potentially estimate in a confirmatory factor analysis model where I have all the possible error variances between my items are allowed, are allowed to correlate and every item, every item is allowed to load on every factor um, and my factors correlate. So this is just all the possible parameters that I could estimate. So this is a model with no constraints and this model actually would not be possible to actually estimate all of these parameters at once. And even if we could, it would not be informative, but this is what it would look like if I had no constraints. So one of the key things to keep in mind when we're doing confirmatory factor analysis is that we were putting constraints on models and we're testing how well the model fits when we put constraints on a model. So the question is, here's a model with no constraints. Instead, I'm doing this model here where I'm putting constraints on my model. I'm not allowing my error variances to correlate. I'm making it so each factor, each item loads on only one factor and not on multiple factors. So I'm putting constraints on the model. And the key question is going to be, when I put these constraints on my model, how well will it fit? So that's what we're going to be doing eventually as we do confirmatory factor analysis. We put these constraints on our model where I say my error variances don't allow to correlate. Each item loads on only one factor. Uh, when I put those constraints on, how well does my model fit? When we put constraints on our confirmatory factor analysis model, it will be important to keep track of how many constraints we're placing on the model. And this slide is just adding up a summary of the constraints that we're making. So we have a total of six factor loadings that we fixed at zero. For example, this one right here, uh, we don't have a loading going from factor two, uh, predicting variance in X1. In other words, X1 is not loading on factors two because we fixed that to be zero. So that's gone. We're essentially fixing that loading to be zero. And we, and we have a total of, uh, we have X1, X2, X3 are not loading on factor two, four, five, and six are not loading on factor one. Altogether, we have fixed a total of six factor loadings are fixed at zero. And if we were to count all these possible correlations between our error variances, uh, 
if we were to add them all up, we would count that there are actually 15 possible correlations. If I have six X variables, that actually gives me 15 different possible correlations between those error variances. And again, I'm fixing all those to be zero. So if we add everything up, we have six factor loadings we fixed at zero, 15 correlations between errors that we have fi fixed at zero. Now, at this point, we've talked about a couple different ways that we could specify or describe what our structural equation model looks like. In this case, a confirmatory factor analysis model. So we've been looking at how we can describe or specify our model by drawing a picture, by drawing this figure where we specify we have our items and our error variances and our lambda loadings and our factors and our correlations between factors. So we've been looking at how we can draw that out using this, this diagram to draw a picture of a confirmatory factor analysis model. And that's one way of describing or specifying what the model is that we're trying to test or estimate. Then we've also talked about how if we're using the R uh, software package and the, the Levon uh, program the package within R, uh, how we can use the the symbols or the terminology within that program to specify a model. We can talk about uh, the tilde is regressed on, tilde tilde could be correlated with or has a variance, the equal tilde is, is an indicator of, so we talked about how we can specify a model using the language of that Levon computer program. Now, I want to give you a third different way that we can use to define or describe uh, or specify a confirmatory factor analysis model. And this approach will involve looking at three different types of matrices. We could talk about what is our factor loading matrix, um, what is our factor variance covariance matrix, and what is our error variance covariance matrix. And this approach uh, will be useful for, I suppose, two reasons. One is that if you can specify and describe a model using different formats, I think you get more familiar with exactly what the model is and how things work. So I think part of the reason for doing the, uh, talking about this third approach to specifying a model will help make sure you, you have a good solid understanding of what exactly is going on in these models. And another reason for talking about this third approach is that this will be very similar to when you run a confirmatory factor analysis and get output. The output will usually follow uh, the format of giving you output for a factor loading matrix, output for a factor variance covariance matrix, in fact, an output for an error variance covariance matrix. And so understanding what these three matrices are will be important for being able to interpret and understand output that you get when you run a confirmatory factor analysis model. So let's look at these three matrices, factor loading, factor variance covariance, error variance covariance, and how we can use these three, three, three matrices to specify or describe what this model is. So the first matrix is the factor loading matrix. And this is very similar to what we looked at in our previous unit on exploratory factor analysis where we had a factor loading matrix and exploratory factor analysis, which was the same thing as our structure matrix or our pattern matrix. That is a matrix of the correlations we get when we get the correlation between each factor and each item, or the standardized regression beta weights we get when we use each item, which use each factor to predict each item, and we get a matrix of factor loadings. And just as with uh, exploratory factor analysis, our factor loading matrix will have a separate row for every single item on our questionnaire. So for example, if I have a questionnaire with six items on it, then I'll have six rows. And I'll have a column for every factor. So if I extract two factors, then I'll have two columns. So just as with exploratory factor analysis, the number of rows equal the number of items, the number of columns equal the number of factors. Now the key thing that's different between exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis in looking at a factor loading matrix is that with exploratory factor analysis, we got values to see how much every single item loaded on every single factor. Now with confirmatory factor analysis, we're going to constrain some of these loadings to be zero. We're going to fix them and say, in our model, we're going to assume that that, uh, for, so for example, X1 we're going to say X1 has an absolutely zero association with factor two. And so right here I have, here's X1, and I'm saying X1 is free to have a loading on 
factor one. What that means is when I do uh, my confirmatory factor analysis and I run my model and I'm going to get parameter estimates. And so I'm going to get a parameter estimate for lambda one. Lambda one is what is the loading for item X one on factor one. That's this right here where I say this, this upper left hand cell here where I say free. That's saying this lambda one right here is free to be whatever it needs to be. That when you, we run our, our computer model and we get output, we're going to get an estimate, a parameter estimate for what that lambda one needs to be. We're, that's essentially telling our computer we want to estimate that. We want to know what that lambda is and it's going to be free to vary. It's going to be free to be whatever it needs to be. And right here I have free for x2 on factor one. That's this lambda right here saying lambda two is free to be whatever it needs to be. It can be a value. It can be a non-zero value. In contrast, we're saying the loading here. So for example, this right here, the loading of factor two on x1, that's right here. That zero is saying that that pathway of factor two in predicting x1, that pathway has to be fixed at exactly zero. Uh, we're not going to get a parameter estimate for that. We're going to tell the computer when you do this model, you need to find one way or another, make that pathway equal to zero. That has to be fixed at zero. So the pathway for lambda one, how much x1 loads on factor one, that's free to be whatever it needs to be. We'll get a parameter estimate for that. But the loading for x1 on factor two, that's fixed at zero. The computer is not going to estimate anything. It's just going to fix that at zero and find a way to make that, that, that constraint fit our model. It's going to make it fit one way or another. And then that's what will happen when we get our results and look at fit. We'll see exactly how well does our model fit when we forced it to make that constraint to say that that loading is zero. So if you look at this factor loading matrix, what it shows us is that we have X1 and X2 and X3. These three predictors are all have the word free here under factor one, saying that these three predictors are all indicators, or these three items, x1, x2, x3, they're all indicators of factor one, and they are all not indicators of factor two. These pathways here between x1, x2, and x3 on factor two are all constrained, fixed to be zero. And likewise, items four, five, and six, they are all free to load on factor two, they are all indicators of factor two. So we'll get parameter estimates for lambda four, lambda five, and lambda six. They correspond to these three words free right here under factor two. That is, we're going to get estimates of lambda four, lambda five, and lambda six. But these three items, x four, five, and six, do not load on factor one. So we have, these are all fixed at zero. So we can look at this loading matrix and understand by what's free and what's fixed to be zero, we can look at that and see, well, that is indicating what our lambda loadings are. Where do we have arrows and where do we not have arrows? So if you see this factor loading matrix like this with freeze and zeros in the matrix, you should be able to draw this part of our model, the, the arrows pointing to which, which factors are, are predicting which items. You should be able to draw that portion of the model based on the factor loading matrix. And you should be able to go both ways. If I show you the, the picture of the model, then you should be able to specify what's free and what's zero in the, in the factor loading matrix. Or if I show you the factor loading matrix, you should be able to draw uh, the, uh, the, the pathways that are indicated by the factor loading matrix. The second matrix will be an error variance covariance matrix. So this is a type of variance covariance matrix. And recall that a variance covariance matrix is a matrix that has variances on the diagonal. And the diagonal is, goes from the upper left to the lower right of a matrix. And so an, uh, a variance covariance matrix will have variances on the diagonal and covariances on the off diagonal. And we've previously looked at variance covariance matrix uh, between items. And this almost looks like we've just got a variance covariance matrix between our six items. If I have six items on my questionnaire, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. When you first look at this, this might think that, well, this is just an air, this is just a variance covariance matrix for these six items, but that's not 
exactly what this is. This is an error variance covariance matrix. That is, it is the variance covariance matrix for the residuals of our six items. That is, if I take my factor scores, whatever those factors are, and I extract the factors out of my items. So for example, the model we've been looking at, x1, x2, x3, these three predictors, or three, three x variables are indicators of factor one. Four, five, and six are indicators of factor two. So if I extract factor one out of these three x variables and I extract factor two out of my next three indicators, I'll have the residuals. These are the scores on x with a factor extracted out of them. That is, if I use the factor to predict each person's score on x and get the residual, which is your new score on x with the factor extracted out of it, and take those residuals and get the variance covariance matrix of those residuals. So this is not the variance covariance matrix of the actual x items. It's not the original items we started off with, but this is the variance covariance matrix of the residuals, that part of each item that could not be explained by the factors. So just like any regular variance covariance matrix, though, the number of rows will equal the number of columns, will equal the number of items. In other words, I'm going to call that a square matrix, um, and that the number of rows equals the number of columns. Uh, and I can call this a diagonal matrix because uh, with any variance covariance matrix, the uh, part below the diagonal is identical as just a mirror image of what's above the diagonal. And because it's a diagonal matrix, I'm just going to leave this top part blank. I just know that uh, it's just a, a mirror image of the bottom part. So if I have a diagonal matrix, meaning that the stuff below the diagonal is just a mirror image of the stuff above the diagonal, I'm going to leave this top part blank because I know it's just redundant and not bother with it. So I have uh, whatever, however many items I have. If I have six items, I'll have six rows and six columns. And what I'll have along the diagonal from the upper left to the lower right will be the variances. This will be, in this case, it'll be the error variance or the residual variance for each x variable after the factor score is extracted out. Because again, this is not a variance covariance matrix of my actual items. It's a covariance covariance matrix of the residuals. So the variance right here for x1 that's the, that's the residual variance of x1, uh, the variance that's left over after the factor has been extracted out of x1. And what this matrix is showing is that every single item, if I have six items on my questionnaire, I'm saying that every single item will have an error variance. Each item has an error variance. So I put the word free right here to say that x1 has an error variance. When I extract the, the factor score out of x1, uh, I'm allowing that error variance to be some non-zero value. It's, and likewise, x2 will have an error variance. I put the word free right there to say x2 will have an error variance. So I put free on every cell along the diagonal to say that every single item will have an error variance. In other words, when I estimate my model, these error variances are free to be whatever they need to be. The computer can estimate an error variance for x1. It can estimate an error variance for x2 because these are free uh, to vary. They're free to be something. Um, note that if I wanted to, I could do a model and constrain these error variances. Uh, this is getting more advanced than what we need to bother with for, for this class. But note that, I, for example, if I wanted to say x3, I'm going to think that x3 has zero error variance, that x3 is a perfect indicator of the factor and it has zero measurement error, and I could constrain that error variance to be uh, zero if I wanted to, or any other value, actually. So if I wanted to put constraints on my error variances, I could, uh, but that's not something we're, that's really going to be useful for us for doing the models we're running here. So I'm going to allow every item to have an error variance. And that's what's indicated by putting the word free along the cells in my diagonal of this matrix. Now, recall that part of what we do for the confirmatory factor analysis model is that we're going to constrain the correlations between our error variances to be zero. So I have 15 uh, covariances, uh, or if I have everything standardized, think of correlations, and I've constrained all these relationships to be zero. So the residual of x1 has a zero covariance or a zero correlation with uh, x2, the residual of x2. 
the residual of x1 has a zero correlation or zero correlation covariance with, with the residual of x3. So all my residuals uh, are constrained to have a zero covariance or a zero relationship with each other. In other words, after I've extracted uh, the factor score out of everything, after the factor score has explained everything that it can explain, then there should be nothing left over in my items that correlate with each other. Those residuals should all have zero correlations. The residual of x1 should correlate zero with the residual of x4 and so forth. So, uh, so what I have here is a, is a matrix uh, where I have the number of rows and number of columns is equal to the number of items. That is, it's a square matrix. And I've drawn this as a diagonal matrix because uh, the, the elements below the diagonal are a mirror image of what's above the diagonal. So I've just left this top half blank uh, because, it's, because it's a diagonal matrix. And um, I've specified uh, along the diagonal that every item is free to have an error variance. And below the diagonal, I've specified all zeros to say that none of these error variances are allowed to correlate with each other. Then finally, the third matrix to look at is actually another variance covariance matrix, but this is a variance covariance matrix for the factors. So this is the factor variance covariance matrix. And this is looking at how much our factors have variances and how much our factors correlate or covary with each other. So this is going to be, because it's a, another variance covariance matrix, it's again going to be a square diagonal matrix uh, because it's a, a variance covariance matrix. And in this case, though, we're looking at correlations and variances for our factors. So we have two factors, factor one and factor two, and each of these factors is going to have a variance and we can look at the covariance or the correlation between our two factors. So this matrix, because we have two factors, the number of rows and the number of columns will be the same as each other because it's square. And the number of rows will equal the number of columns, which will be the number of factors. So if we have two factors, we'll have two rows and two columns. If we went on and say had a three factor uh, model, we'd have three rows and three columns. Or if we had a four factor model, it would have four rows and four columns. And so, uh, so with just two factors, it's fairly small. And here it is right here. Here is our factor variance covariance matrix. And as with any variance covariance matrix, we have variances on the diagonal. So right here, where I have F1 with F1, when I say free in the upper left hand corner, that's this variance right here. It's saying that factor one will have a variance. And down here I have in the lower right hand corner, F2 with F2, that is the variance for factor two. That's this right here saying that factor two will have a variance. And then I'm allowing a covariance between factor one and factor two, which is this covariance or this correlation. If I standardize everything, uh, correlation standardized covariance. So this is the correlation or the covariance between my two factors. And in this case, I'm not going to, I'm not going to constrain any of these things. I'm going to let all these things be free to vary. I'm going to say factor one can have a variance. Factor two can have a variance and there can be a covariance between my two factors or a correlation between my two factors. Um, and again, uh, these are all things that we could constrain and we will actually look at situations uh, later on here where we might actually want to constrain our variances to, to help standardize things and we might want to constrain a correlation or covariance between factors if I wanted to test an orthogonal model. So we, there are situations where we might want to put constraints on these parameters, uh, but for right now, Specify, if I want to specify this model that we're looking at right here, uh, I'm just saying that both factors have uh, variances and that's free to be whatever they need to be. We're going to allow the computer to estimate variances for our factors and we're going to allow the computer to estimate a parameter estimate for the correlation of the covariance between our two factors. So again, uh, if I gave you uh, say these three matrices, the factor variance covariance matrix, the error variance covariance matrix, and the factor loading matrix, if I gave you those three matrices and specified zeros and free, uh, you should be able to reconstruct um, this model right here from those matrices. Or conversely, if I gave you this model, you should be able to reconstruct those three matrices and determine what, what should be labeled as free and what should be labeled as fixed at zero.
So as I mentioned, uh, we could place constraints on our factor variance covariance matrix. Uh, for example, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we could constrain this correlation between our two factors to be zero, or to constrain that covariance to be zero, constrain there to be zero relationship between our two factors. And as I mentioned, that would be essentially the same thing as testing an orthogonal solution, like when we talked about exploratory factor analysis and distinguish between an oblique rotation where our factors were correlated and an orthogonal rotation where there was zero correlation between our factors. If we wanted to model an orthogonal type of solution with confirmatory factor analysis, we could just fix this correlation or this covariance to be zero, and that would force us to have a model where our factors have a zero correlation, and then we could test the fit of that model and see how well that model fits. Another thing to note, and this will actually become relevant later on, um, think about what would happen if we constrained this coral, if we constrained this to be a correlation of one. Actually, we can go about doing that uh, if we constrained our two variances to be one so that these were standardized and constrained the, the covariance between our two standardized uh, factors to be one. That would actually create a correlation of one. So we could create a situation where we have, we could put a constraint on a model where we constrain that correlation to be one. And essentially, what we do at that point, that's actually the same thing as testing a unidimensional model. That would be actually be the same thing as if I said I have one factor and all six items are indicators of that one factor. So if I just had, just get rid of that, get rid of that. If I just had one factor where all items were loading on that one factor, um, that's really kind of messy there, but uh, hopefully you get the idea of what I'm talking about here, that I could specify a model where I say I have just factor one and all six items are loading on that factor one. I don't have any other factors. That would be a one factor solution. We'd actually get essentially the same thing if I did this two factor model and constrained there to be a perfect correlation between my two factors, because if I constrain that correlation to be one, I'm essentially saying factor one is the same thing as factor two. I'm essentially creating uh, these two factors and merging them together and creating a single factor out of them by saying these two factors have a perfect correlation, meaning they're the same thing. So we have actually a couple alternate ways we could go about creating a unidimensional model. I could, I could just say I have one factor and all six items are uh, indicators of that one factor. That would be the normal way to do it. Uh, but another way, and actually there, there, we'll find out later on, there are some places where this actually will be co a convenient thing to do. Uh, for example, if I started off with a two-factor model and I'd written all my code and my program to test that model, and then I wanted to quickly test, well, how does it look if I run, if I specify this as a unidimensional one-factor model, um, rather than having to write your code all over again to go from a two-factor model to a one-factor model, you can just fix this correlation to be one, and poof, right there, there you go. Now it's a unidimensional single factor model. So now let's look at our three matrices and add it all up and count and see how many parameter estimates do we have that are free to vary and how many parameter estimates do we have that are fixed? How many free things, how many fixed things do we have? So if we add it all up, we have these three uh, lambda loadings on our first factor and then three lambda loadings on our second factor. We've got uh, our two variances for our factors and our covariance or our correlation between our factors. So we've got another three things over here in our factor variance covariance matrix. And then we have these six air variances for our six items. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We've got a total of 15. If we add them all up, uh, the word free appears 15 times in this figure. We've got 15 free parameters. And then how many places have we assigned a zero to a parameter? How many zeros appear? We've got uh, three down here and three. We got a total of six zeros. Six parameters are fixed to be zero in our factor loading matrix. Uh, nothing's fixed to be zero in our factor variance covariance matrix. Uh, and then we have all of our error variances, uh, correlations between our error variances are fixed to be zero. And if we add that up, we have 21 zeros in this uh, picture here. We've got 21 parameters that are fixed to be zero. So we've got a total of 15 free parameters and 21 fixed parameters. Now let's compare that to what we have in our variance covariance matrix.
Recall from our previous unit when we talked about structural equation modeling, how the process of structural equation modeling starts off with a variance covariance matrix. We use that variance covariance matrix to produce parameter estimates. And then we use our parameter estimates to reconstruct a variance covariance matrix. And then we can compare how well our reconstructed variance covariance matrix matches our original variance covariance matrix that we actually got from our sample of data. And we're going to be doing that essentially that same process here uh, when we're doing confirmatory factor analysis. And recall one of the issues that we talked about before was the issue of degrees of freedom. That if we estimate the same number of parameters as we have elements in our variance covariance matrix, we called that model a saturated model. And that was a situation where uh, when we recreate our variance covariance matrix from a model, it will exactly reproduce the actual sample variance covariance matrix because we had zero degrees of freedom and our model was saturated. We have positive degrees of freedom when we have a situation where the number of parameter estimates in our model is fewer than the number of elements in our variance covariance matrix. And that is what we want when we're doing confirmatory factor analysis. We want to have positive degrees of freedom because when we have positive degrees of freedom, it means that our model won't fit perfectly and it raises the question of exactly how well does our model fit. And one of the key things we'll be doing when we do confirmatory factor analysis is we put constraints on our model and then we'll see how well does our model fit when we put those constraints on the model. So when we do confirmatory factor analysis, uh, we will want to pay attention to degrees of freedom and we will want those degrees of freedom to, to be positive. We want to make sure that the number of elements in our variance covariance matrix is greater than the number of parameters that we're estimating in our model. So we we'll want to be able to calculate degrees of freedom. So uh, what are the number of data, when I say here degrees of freedom equals number of data points, that is going to be the number of elements in the variance covariance matrix minus the number of parameters that are free to vary, the ones that we're going to estimate. So if we fix something to be zero, uh, that's not something we're estimating. That's not a free parameter. We want to know how many parameters are free to vary. So we want to count up the number of free parameters and then count up the number of data points. That is, what are the number of elements in our variance covariance matrix? And data points minus free parameters will give us our degrees of freedom. Now, uh, when you have small matrices, you could just look at the covariance covariance matrix and count things up. Uh, but as matrices get bigger, it, it can be a little bit harder to keep track of exactly how many elements do you have in a variance covariance matrix. Um, and so an easy way to do that, I have this formula here that if, if you're doing confirmatory factor analysis and, and you have a certain number of items of X variables, if you take the number of X variables, multiply it by the number of X variables plus one, and then divide by two, that is an easy way to calculate the number of unique elements in your item variance covariance matrix. I mean, you could uh, just maybe plot out a variance covariance matrix or just, you know, could you could just make your own little table here. You've got six items, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and make a grid there and then count how many cells do you have um, that are uh, not counting the ones above the diagonal. And you could do it that way, uh, but that could be kind of time consuming. So an easier way to get uh, the number of unique elements in your variance covariance matrix is, is just to use this formula, number of X variables times number, number of X variable, number of X variable variables plus one, and then divide that by two. So for example, if I have a questionnaire with six items on it, if I plug this formula in, six plus six plus one is seven, six times seven divided by two, I get 21. In other words, there are 21 unique elements in the variance covariance matrix for those six items. So putting it all together, uh, we just saw, we just counted up a little moment ago that we had 15 free parameter estimates in this model. And then just now we determined that we had 21 elements in our variance covariance matrix. So our degrees of freedom, we take 21 minus 15. We have 21 elements in our variance covariance matrix. We have 15 frees. If we count up all the words that all the times I wrote the word free here, we got 15 free parameters that we're estimating. So 21 minus 15 means our degrees of freedom are six. Note that this example turned out to be just a little confusing because it turned out if you add up all the zeros, there's 21 fixed parameters 
and we have 21 elements in our variance covariance matrix. It just happened to be that that's the same number. Usually those aren't the same number. That usually doesn't come out that way. Usually the number of fixed parameters and the number of elements would be two different numbers. Just by a random coincidence, it turned out that those both happened to be 21. But the thing that really matters here is what's the number of elements in our variance covariance matrix? What are the number of free parameters? And then take the number of elements minus the number of free parameters to get degrees of freedom. So in this case, we have six degrees of freedom. And note that is a positive number. It's not zero. We don't have a saturated model. Um, and it's not a negative number. If it was negative, we couldn't estimate our model. It's, we have a positive degrees of freedom, which means we can talk about fit. We can uh, run a model where we'll get output and we'll estimate our parameter estimates, and then we'll also get information on fit to say how well does the reconstructed variance covariance matrix match the original sample variance covariance matrix given the constraints that we put on a model, which will tell us about the reasonableness of the constraints that we're putting on our model. So we've got six degrees of freedom. Now, at this point, uh, we just about have everything we need to specify a confirmatory factor analysis model, that is to describe what it is and to clarify what parameters are free and what are fixed, and that will allow us to put this into a program and get results from a confirmatory factor analysis. But before we proceed, there's one more issue we need to address, and that is the issue of identification. And I'm going to put that on our next video.